we go. See? That's all there is to it. Just the corner. Think about shape and form. Drop these little rascals in wherever you want them. That's the fun part. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Shake it off. <laughs> beat the devil out of it. <laughs> and just beat the devil out of it. Because <laughs> I get even with the crew for picking on me here. Maybe we'll do two. Really get them. <laughs> and cover everybody in the studio. Actually, I just like to get even with the cameraman because he gives me a hard time. You don't have to be crazy to do this, but it does help. Richard's been with me <laughs> since the first series. And as you can see, Richard has finally got smart and he now wears a raincoat. He got tired of all of his clothes being painted. And today you, you experienced the joy of painting. And from all of us here, until the next show, I'd like to wish you happy painting and God bless my friend. So much for that pair of pants. I'll tell you what. Last year in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, maybe even one of my first adventures out back into the grocery store, I came across this guy, this warm, good-natured gentleman, Bob Ross, in the checkout line, just inviting me to pay $13.99 to check out his life story. And you know what I did? I sure did, because I didn't steal this. So, from his fro, to his finger, to his childhood, to the a little bit of the business aspect, although we're not going to get into the very popular Netflix series um, about all the drama between his son and his old business partner who apparently are really at odds and uh, his son is not making a penny off this and his old business partner and her husband and daughter apparently are making all the pennies off this so um, I'm not going to really make judgment on that other than that fact because it did portray her and that documentary portrayed her as a uh, shady very domineering business figure um, but on the other side a, a little bit of research uh, at least one thing I read said that the son who was the protagonist of the documentary apparently went into hiding or, or made himself very hard to contact um, for years up and really until I think 2017 I think I read so I you know I'm not gonna make judgment one way or another but um, it seems on the surface of it a little sad that Bob Ross's only son isn't reaping any of the profits from this trademark here but anyway uh we're gonna get into this guy's calm and wisdom you don't have to be crazy to do this but it does help and evolution of his calm and wisdom touching upon his fro his finger his ex-military his military career and um, all sorts of other interesting things including the connection with ASMR which is really what uh, made me want to buy it but the guy is you know undoubtedly I mean look at that smile the warmest um, I don't know he just seems like such a an honest, straight shooting, artistic, beautiful man. And uh, I wanted to get to know more about what led such a an honest blue collar fella to uh, get into painting, let alone start his own quiet, soft, spoken, which I'm 
uh, very much the uh, one of the many descendants in uh, progeny, I guess, of. He just seemed like such an interesting guy, and he left such a solid stamp on the uh, the culture of art in all shapes and sizes. He we're gonna get into his early life, the painting studio situation, the uh, aspects of ASMR that it uh, inspired, and um, the legacy of his company a little bit in the gallery at the very end, some selections. Which I'll show you guys if you're not familiar with them. My favorite one is actually one of his earliest. It's a beautiful um, painting depiction of the Alaskan auroras. There we go, right there. Let's try to hold that up to the camera. Let's get that up there. And there we go, right there. Northern Lights, 1986. Bob experienced the bright dancing lights of the Aurora Borealis during his first, his time in Alaska in the U.S. Air Force. I think uh, maybe what drew my eye to is just because most of his paintings aren't at night. I don't think actually I've seen any of them be at night. Except this one. So it's really stands out a lot, but I think it's just beautiful in Aurora. You can just feel yourself standing there on the lake shore, standing outside your cabin looking at the lights reflect off the placid, cold lake at night. Or, or maybe even the uh, even during the day, if it's during uh, winter, when the days are really, really, really short in that far north. But, um, yeah, undoubtedly the guy was a great talent. And any great people I'm always interested in learning a lot more about, because that's how we learn learn what to do and what not to do with our short, fleeting, but possibly if we make the right moves, deeply, deeply meaningful existence. And this guy, he made some right moves, spreading uh, the joy, oh, I thought I was going to be able to point to, there we go, the joy of <laughs> painting, wasn't, wasn't quick, uh, quick on the draw there to the world and for time's sake and maybe copyright reasons I won't read this word for word but uh, this guy Jim Needham was uh, a manager of the uh, studio that ultimately became the home for the uh, series The Joy of Painting and Muncie, Indiana. This is a, uh, a pretty beautiful uh, letter, sort of essay about some of the more um, just just this man's perception of Bob and, and his work relationship with him, and uh, it said that. He, he came into the studio to start the Joy Painting Series and, and uh, they immediately jumped on the opportunity and um, came in with his business partner, partner Annette Kowalski. She's the, the villain of the documentary aforementioned. Um, but this wasn't actually his first time or there, him and Annette's first time making a painting show, I believe, later in this magazine they uh it's like uh, three or four different 
sort of mini bios written by different people, so there was overlapping stories. This uh, was the beginning of the relationship, I guess, out uh, east in Virginia, I think. He had tried, and then kind of dissolved the um, the initial series that him and Annette tried to create. But it's cool to think that he, he was sure of himself in the sense that he's quoted in here multiple times that um, if you have the passion for something the money will follow and you know in hindsight it seems like he was a guaranteed win for uh, any television producers but he I mean who would have guessed like this is for instance a glimpse into the rig and apparently this was in a big kind of a uh, dining room situation with a, a camp a campfire a fireplace behind him and they decided he initially wanted to do like a log cabin and make it a really natural intimate setting which which he ultimately was able to tap into just simply by his voice and, and intonation and demeanor while walking you through his art but the obviously they ended up going with a black it's a very simple straightforward black backdrop and this camera here we'll get a better picture of it down the road uh, see if I can find it real quick yeah here we go see this studio camera here. I'm trying to be as graceful as possible because I, I got a tight setup here. Um, I mean look at that camera and that looks, it's got like counterbalancing weights on it. It uh, looks like it's got like sandbags weighing it down so it doesn't tip over. Just imagine all of this and like a million other features is crammed into our phones that I'm recording right now. This little, you know, pounder, two pound phone. No, not even <laughs> two pounds. It's not two pounds. I don't know, maybe, you know, 12 ounce phone. It's just amazing that he was able to create this beautiful not only painting but a beautiful um, to her mood you know a, a vibe if you will with his his presence and his vision um I don't know, it just seems so out of place for television. This is uh, the mid-80s, I think they started it. It's so... It's inspirational to think that this guy was a, a trendsetter. He... Some of this was... You you can watch in the documentary. It's much more concise than this is going to be. But, uh... This guy named... Hmm, what's his name? This German painter was who Bob was influenced by, who did the exact same setup, but with much more vibrant, to put it politely, demeanor. And um, Bob didn't like the guy. But it, it's, I would say it's similar. And Bob, this is where Bob broke ground. Maybe he was influenced by Fred Rogers, or uh, even vice versa. I don't know, but. He was almost certainly an influence to be soft-spoken and have a more intimate uh, approach to conversing with who he assumed was watching. You know, he was just talking to a camera and had to, as I am doing right now, I have to make the leap and assume that uh, you guys are interested in what I'm saying. Um, and this, this, this German guy, 
uh, apparently got a little bitter that Bob kind of, you know, took what he was doing, put his own more gentle, soft-spoken spin on it, and really, really, really took off. Um, and unfortunately, his life was, Bob's life was cut short. I think he died at 52 with lymphoma, a type of very aggressive cancer. In 94, I think. It's really, really sad. Um, but it's so brilliant. I, it's inspiring for me to know that this guy took what uh, the German guy was doing and then the German guy was just like a vlogger, like a very loud Logan Paul type vlogger. Let me, I use that word fire and I love that word fire and because I love to fire in like this. I hate to, to go on the, I want to be fresh, I want to be powerful, I want to be the commander, the chief, the butter washer, and then it works for me. It works for everyone if you do it just like that. And it's like Bob was like, let's do that, but do the ASMR version of it. I like to fish, but I'm not a very good fisherman because I catch him and take him out of the water and take the hook out and put a band-aid on him, give him a little CPR, pat him on the tutu and put him back in there. And so they'll be there the next time I come. And, um, you know, that's uh, really, who would have thought that it would have helped so many people relax? And, and he got a lot of feedback, as we'll see here. Um, And he kind of recognized that what he was doing was therapeutic, I guess. Therapeutic's a, a good word, good adjective. And it's cool to know that even though you might not, the, a lot of people might not be able to see that, he had the vision. And he says uh, at one point that um, he talks to people as though or maybe it was someone close to him describing his, his style. He talks to people as though <laughs> he's, uh, he's in bed with them, you know, having a conversation just between them, very intimate. And um, <laughs> one could argue he was trying to exude a little bit of sex appeal with his open collar shirt. So you could see here, uh, you know, this is obviously him in a more casual outdoor eating setting, but uh, yeah, I guess go back to the same photo. You can see there he uh, he's got the the open collar. And there's the guy. Let's see, what was his name? Bill Alexander. This is the German painter who Bob was inspired by. He was a television personality, but he was very boisterous, very, you know, loud, to put it crassly. Um, extroverted. Bob was the introverted version of this guy. And, um... I think it's just a beautiful thing that Bob put out into the universe to be able to uh, talk about something he loved while doing something beautiful, creating something beautiful on the fly. And um, he, uh, interestingly, another one of the many interesting bits of trivia in this book here is that he pre he made three copies of every painting that we see made one as a template so that he could reference it he made the second one live on camera while looking at the reference painting that he had been able to take his time on um, right off camera so it was it was him actually painting on the fly and actually doing that, unlike a cooking show, um, you know, where they, they 
mix the ingredients together and then already have a pre-made version in the oven ready to pull out so you don't actually have to wait for the baking time um, no he made that entire painting the second one live in 25 minutes or so something like that and then to auction off for any in the crazy um, the more you learn about him the more admirable this guy is he made the third one to auction off um, so he was able to spend a little more time on it for charitable uh, reasons with the local public television stations that he was being aired on so it's really amazing here's a little how-to guy So he uh, just love, uh, sometimes you read a little more about people you're inspired by and you come away with a less, <laughs> less admiration for them. And this guy was the exact opposite. He inspired me even further to really I guess kind of be all the behind the scenes people said he was the same as uh, behind off camera as he was on so it's it's cool um, yeah he you know he tried to exude an intimate if one could say slightly tinted with sexual persona uh, a sexual vibe but um, you know he was just trying to be a quiet but charismatic inviting warm teacher uh, yet yet humble and uh, just spreading joy while painting so I loved it let's try to see what else we can glean off this little article here yeah his work ethic was unreal he would record let's see regardless of distractions of travel and guest appearances across the country as his show gathered its audience Bob recorded 13 shows every three months and he didn't do it across three months he did it in like one week and uh He'd come into the studio. And like he, did, he uh, our partnership thrived under the. I remember this guy was the studio manager here, um, in charge of the crew and all that. And uh, it thrived under his friendship and professionalism. I respect people who are able to be. I don't know, just friendly and casual, and yet be able to have their stuff together enough to be very professional. It's cool. It's just inspiring to see people be very competent, and so competent, in fact, I guess, is really what it inspires me, um, that they're able to take on the casual, informal demeanor of, you know, someone who... Like, they don't have to go out, out of their way to prove and flaunt their competence, you know. It's nice. It's cool. I like it. It's very, uh, what's the word, uh, approachable, um, relatable, I guess. Yeah, relatable. It's humble. And he, uh... He had a rare and unpredictable sense of humor, 
in an aspiring optimism and a crystal clear vision about what he wanted on his show. So he would come into the studio a typical week here for him um, every three months to make this happen. Actually, let's get this a little closer. Let's see Bob. Typical week was that he'd come into the studio, set up on Sunday nights, tape the opens and closes Monday, on Tuesday and Wednesday, in two days, he would tape all 13 episodes. All 13 episodes. 13 half-hour episodes where he would paint an entire painting in like 25 minutes. It's amazing. And then... We'd preview them on Thursdays and Fridays toward the countryside around Muncie looking for Albi, Albany Glass, a collecting hobby Bob had developed along with, with my wife, Jim Needham. And, uh, you know, Jim didn't need them, but apparently Bob liked collecting the Albany Glass, so it was really Bob who needed him. To me, he loved laugh, play, practical jokes. Um, like this. My favorite story about him, the guy says, Jim Needham. A couple from a small town east of Muncie, Indiana, had won a bid to purchase one of these paintings that Bob had painted on air that night. So they arrived at 11.30 p.m., pretty late. Um, the place where we held the auction had a number of stairs, but the lady was disabled. So she waited in the parking lot, and Bob fetched the painting, quickly descended the steps, and hugged her. And what she said has stuck with me to this day. She said, you're the best part of my day, to, to Bob, obviously. Um, every day I'm in constant pain and I sit on the couch and watch you paint and when I'm watching you the pain goes away thank you for making my time with you the best part of every day man I thought that's so cool that's uh, and then he says yeah I, I realize exactly the effect that a good-natured warm positive person talking directly to them can have and it's so true Bob's vision of happiness focusing on what is good and happy in our and fortuitous in our lives versus always looking at the negative. Bob chose to see what's good and pure and lovely and to focus on what we can do, not what we wish we could have done. And at the end of every show, Bob chose to sign off a blessing by blessing each viewer with his parting gifts. Happy painting and God bless. This day, you had a fantastic day and today you, you experienced the joy of painting. And from all of us here, until the next show, I'd like to wish you happy painting and God bless my friend. It's awesome. Okay. Let's learn about his early life. And here they chose to display a uh, picture of an ocean which Bob, they mentioned, didn't typically paint. Or no, they mentioned, with rare exceptions, Bob's painting 
put nature front and center. The ocean, forest, the mountain. But they didn't typically, he didn't typically paint. paint. Um, I don't think he ever painted people on camera. Um, but he didn't even typically paint man-made structures like buildings and bridges. Sometimes, though, he did. <laughs> Inside the intensively private life of the painter with the most famous perm <laughs> on, on public television. It's beautiful. I live near the ocean and that's a really good depiction. That could be a little more broken up, but um, I mean, just imagine this guy. He probably painted this one in 30 minutes. That's superhuman, it seems like. But that's the other aspect of him. He was always... He didn't make it about himself. The entire point of the show was that anyone could find the joy in painting. And he always was positive and encouraged others to be able to uh, paint. That's what Molly, my wife always says too, you know, with drawing and um, we, we actually had a conversation about this recently about, uh, she has a, a good friend of hers who's a really, really exceptional artist and um, she doesn't even, she just does it as a hobby and um, she's amazing and we're talking about how sometimes you'll run into people and, and I'm not as good as her, um, but I like to draw and doodle and, you know, I've made occasional drawings that I'm proud of. And when someone says, or, or you know, I play the guitar, I'm, I'm like, that's eh, so-so, but if someone who doesn't play hears it and says, wow, you have a, a gift, in a way, yes, it's a compliment, but in a way, it's, a, it's also an excuse for them to think that it's a gift and maybe there might be a genetic component to it but I think more people than they realize are capable of creating art and uh, that's the message I like to spread at least so here's uh, here's a picture of Bob here And there, and there really isn't much that I've found about Bob. He, uh, again, grew up in Florida near Orlando. Um, about two hours from there. It's pretty cool. And uh, he really was private. I think one of the th interesting things, uh, and you know, obviously he would have given a lot more interviews and a lot more would have been known about his private life if he had lived longer, I'm sure. But... Um, he he said uh, that at one point he was a couple of years before he died when he was gaining popularity a newspaper asked him why there weren't more interviews from him and he simply said he would uh, he admitted that he kind of made himself a little hard to find but if asked he would always oblige in an interview, but he was rarely asked, so interesting. I guess people weren't <laughs> as determined to go out and find him to get the interview, but uh, as they should have been. This caption says, back in the days when we used to listen to, what's a quote by Bob Ross from 1990, back in the days when we used to listen to the shows on the radio before TV was popular enough for my neighborhood <laughs> for my neighborhood to have one I used to listen to some of the radio shows and they'd be sad sad at the end <laughs> and they'd be sad at the end and I'd threaten my brother if he ever told anybody that I'd got sobby eyed over some of these things I'd beat him up no, I didn't say that, but I had to adapt because I misspoke.
But yeah, the uh, that clearly shows he was uh, he was uh, an emotional fella. With his soft, soothing, soft-spoken manner and his immediately recognizable mop of curls, Bob Ross wasn't the sort of flashy art world star likely to generate headlines. And we have an idea here of his, uh, at least one of his backgrounds. He was a medical records technician in the U.S. Air Force in Anchorage, Alaska. Or I think he was stationed in Fairbanks before he took up his first painting lesson at an Anchorage, Alaska USO club. And that's another amazing fact is that, you know, he was, I'm sure he was always artistically inclined, but he was a working man. He dropped out of high school, was a, an apprentice carpenter with his father. And then I think he had a, an early kid at a very early age with his wife who ended up leaving. So he had three different wives. Uh, one who he had that kid with, who I think was the center of that documentary. And she left him with the boy. And so he went into the Air Force and, and met his uh his second wife shortly after and uh you know decided to re go as far away from Florida without going to Hawaii as, as is possible and relocated to Alaska I don't know whether that was on uh his accord you know or not um but it's interesting that it's across the country as far away from Florida as you can get. And probably as different from Florida as it gets, too. Being very mountainous, Florida is really flat. Maybe it's, Florida's really humid. Maybe Alaska's humid, too, with all the snow. But uh, flat and hot and salty in Alaska's fresh water if you're not by the ocean very a lot of elevation and obviously not hot not very hot Phil Donahue a famous uh, kind of a hmm Steve Harvey type talk show host, I don't know, um, Dr. Phil type guy in the 80s, real famous guy, without any flash, says about Bob Ross, without any flash, his paintings spoke for him, he took you by the hand and led you along the way. He granted very few interviews, much of what was known about Ross can be surmised by the occasional remarks he'd make while adding happy little trees to his paintings. Here we have a picture of him. And I'll give you a second to guess which one he is, because I I couldn't guess at first which one he was. He's this guy. Slight chub to him. I thought he was the guy getting married. Wow, that looks like Jenna Fisher from The Office, doesn't it? Kind of. Looks like Johnny Depp. It's like a cast of... Who's that? That looks like, uh, that's his brother. God, I want to say it looks like, um, famous astronaut, John Glenn, I think. Anyways. Yeah, that's Bob Ross.
right there and right here. Let's readjust that. And Bob's brother Jim's wedding. We used to fight like cat and dogs, you know. You know how brothers are, he says. He's a good man, though. <laughs> He's my best friend in the whole world. And then Bob says, uh, you know, his children, Bob and Jim, ran wild through the Florida woods. And shoot, we were tough, Bob said. We didn't even wear shoes back then. Don't think we had any. Don't think we had any. So his dad... No, Bob was born Robert Norman Ross. Bob being the nickname for Robert. In 1942. Man, his birthday is actually coming up. October 29th. Huh. Um, Daytona Beach, Florida, the furniture entrepreneurial artist, <laughs> furniture, the future, the future art entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial artist, was the only son of carpenter Jack Ross and his waitress wife Ollie. The family soon moved to Orlando where young Bob, which is, uh, Orlando's only like an hour west of Daytona, and a half, who enjoyed an especially strong bond with his mother, developed a passion for the outdoors that would influence his predilection for capturing the natural world on canvas. It is really touching that Bob had a close connection with his mom. Because I, I think I do with my mom. I get a lot of my softer um, personality traits from her, I think. And uh, she had the largest influence on him, said Annette Kowalski. She was the one who taught him the love of wildlife. Second to painting, or maybe even more than painting, Bob loved wildlife. And he famously, towards the end, in the early 90s, brought animals and most famously a squirrel. There might be a picture here. Onto uh, the TV. They <laughs> I love that he said that my Well, quickly he said uh Um, I'm very prejudiced, of course, but I think I had the greatest mother there was. Which is beautiful. The funny part is that Ross, his parents separated when Bob was very young and his mother remarried briefly, had another son, Jim, and, uh, and then Jack and Ollie would briefly reunite much later in Ross's life. So the, uh, his parents split, remarried two different people, split up with those people, and came back together at least for a oh, time being. When I was a kid, I used to sit around, Bob said. They had little in the way of toys, so they turned to nature for amusement. I would sit around, and my brother and I, we'd look at the clouds, and we'd pick out all kinds of shapes. We'd see the mean old witch, or the candy man, or whatever. In school, he earned generally poor marks. As he was painting on camera, he once commented that as he was offering instruction to the audience, 
You see these little X's? See, little X's there? That's just the way the teacher used to grade my work. My, my papers in school. She'd just run across it and go X, X, X. <laughs> Love that. Um, he was a bit of a daredevil. He had a Corvette Stingray. He didn't know how to fly, even though he was in the Air Force for whatever reason. But uh, I could see him here probably coming back from a, a plane ride, maybe. And he had a Corvette. She loved to go real fast on. I think when I was a kid, I must have had every kind of pet imaginable, he says. I lived in Florida, so I had access to a lot of creatures. I had a pet snake. Man, he got out of the cage and was lost in the house for a long time. My mother got up one night and went to the bathroom and he was there. Scared her. And, uh, Kowalski and that, his business partner, said that uh, she thinks that because they were pretty poor, he, he would use the toys, the animals as, you know, entertainment toys, you know, to take care of them. Um, Ross dropped out of school in the ninth grade, so his dad taught him to be a carpenter. Because he wanted, you know, to have some sort of means to earn a living. Just as any good dad would do. I think that's great. And he's like, I'll tell you what, Bob said, it isn't easy. It isn't that easy to make a shed or a barn. The lessons had unforeseen consequence, though. He lost a finger during a woodworking project. And it's funny, none of these pictures, I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but... You know, after you read that fact, it's it's hard to not look for it. Um, I don't think I see one picture. See there? Eh, maybe it's technically in that picture, but it's so small you, you wouldn't be able to see that. Hands aren't there. Although he's got a, that long fingernail there. Um, yeah, it's just like, I think it was on his left hand. It's the one where he holds his palette. So it's right there. It's that one right there. can't see it in any of these pictures. Oh, made a liar out of me. You can hardly tell in the, looks like, he, you know, it might just be to the unaided, the un, uh, you know, the person who doesn't know. Let's hold it up to the camera there, you can see that a little bit. Yeah. Just kind of tell. It's uh, yeah, it's probably easiest. It's not really the most high def picture. It's probably easiest to look at it from a distance. There, you can just kind of tell. It doesn't have it. So I mean, clearly, you know, like anybody awkward to have to explain what happened so you know I, I understand he'd naturally developed a way he would naturally develop a way of holding his hand but even there you can't even see it there he's got it in positions it's natural to probably hold your hand in positions where you um, you know you uh, wouldn't expose it very much So he had a snake, I think he had a, a gator at some point. But it's right where, uh, on his left hand and not his right, so it didn't affect his ability to hold the brush. 
So, um, now he didn't do carpentry for any more than a couple years at least. He enlisted in the military in the early 1960s. So he, uh, interestingly, I mean, it's really, again, encouraging that he worked pretty much a full career before he stopped to do the joy of painting. And he didn't start painting until, I believe, well into his life, you know, into his 20s at least, I think, something like that. So to me, that's really encouraging. And, And that's probably a big reason why he he was so encouraging the viewers to uh, not be too hard on themselves and give it a try give it a join the air force at 18 married his wife had a son steve but their union was short-lived leaving ross to raise steve on his own in florida for several years several years until the military transferred him to alaska At 21 years, he had never seen snow. I think I was... I was probably like 12 before I saw snow. My buddy uh, took me up skiing in Vermont, and that was awesome. Let's see. Quickly became accustomed to life in Alaska, remarrying pretty quick settling down near Fairbanks with his wife Jane, who was also a worker in the Air Force. A civilian worker, though. And for more than a decade, he was a medical technician and took his first painting lesson at an Anchorage USO club. It was there that he discovered his love for oil painting and began to spend his free time putting images to canvas. Oh, and that's right. That's where he uh, started doing it as a side hustle. He worked as a bartender. And he would paint the side of, of gold mining pans. He would, you know, as a little tourist uh, trinkets. And he made good money selling them. Very cool. So he, he was uh, entrepreneurial. A little bit. So actual paintings too. Paintings too. That's the microwave. grandma here today allowing me to make this video so Bob's show was the joy of painting and then he was watching the the guy Bill Alexander a German art instructor in about 1975 about 10 years before Bob recorded his first joy of painting so about 1975 is when Bob first saw Bill Alexander on public television painting painting about 1975, I saw Alexander on television like millions of other people. I fell in love with him. I fell in love with him. In 30 minutes, Bob saw Alexander stand in front of a canvas, palette in hand, speak directly to the audience as he completed a landscape painting. That was Ernie, by the way. Um, I realize it gets weird if you don't realize what's who's who's uh, sighing in the background. Sorry, buddy. We'll go on a bike ride. Don't worry, buddy. Don't worry. Um, 
you know, this wet on wet technique allows them to uh, be able to paint, uh, I guess, blend the colors more quickly. And as long as you keep the background wet, it, it uh, just makes maybe it's it's easier on the mistakes. You can blend them out more easily. But yeah, I mean, you could. And I love again the humility of Bob Ross. Uh, he never snubbed this guy, but um, he was. Obviously not very, um, and I'm sure there's more about his military career that uh, we could find out about, but there wasn't much in this magazine. But he uh, clearly had a love of painting, and maybe the military isn't exactly the organization uh for him to uh, fulfill his passion with. You know, he was doing it for a paycheck for his son and his family. And it's really, really cool, I think, that he was able to make make ultimately make a show based on something that he started doing as he really learned as a hobby late in life and then tried to flip by selling paintings on the side and um, became an entrepreneur with it. And um, I mean, obviously there's a huge overlap with what I'm attempting to do with this channel. It's been amazing. I never could have imagined. I'd, uh, you know, I have more than a couple hundred people watching my stuff. It's just mind blowing. Um, to be able to have that connection with people must have been so rewarding for Bob. It's really amazing, really, really inspiring. And look, they even have the easel, the original easel made from a converted stepladder. That's funny. I would have taken that step out so I could not get blocked, I could stand closer to the painting, but, uh, that's just me. <laughs> yeah. Um, was acquired by the Smithsonian Institution. That's how much of a cultural icon Bob was and is. So, the connection with Bill is that he, he, Bob, saw him, uh, Bill was on public television, Bill Alexander, the German guy, but he was also making a, maybe a majority of his income, probably, now that I think about it, teaching students, and um, I guess the general business model is if you get a big enough business, you could teach other students who are good enough to work for you by also teaching other you know, more more uh, classes than you would otherwise be, w be able to do as a one-man show. And Bob became one of Bill Alexander's instructors, certified instructors, ultimately. And about 15 years later, Bob would carry on that same business model. Um... And this is a beautiful American dream story. Let's see. Bob started pursuing it. Anyway, at the time, he, uh, he his income started increasing, selling the gold pans and the paintings of the Alaskan landscapes to tourists, to the point where he started really being able to foresee get closer to taking the risk of actually making it a full-time job. And so, Ross left Alaska 
to study with Alexander in California, quickly becoming his, pupil, his star pupil. Ra said, I took one class and I went crazy. Um, looks like little June bugs up right now. So We got mommy and grandma doting on her in the background. Um, I'm sure you'll hear her. I'll try to edit it out. But uh, it's beautiful in that Ross's wife remained behind in Alaska with, her, with their son Steve. But she enthusiastically supported her husband's artistic pursuits. She allowed Bob to leave Alaska and with a thousand dollars in his pocket, told him to either go out and make a fortune or come back home. And Bob promised her that I'll go and do this and if it doesn't work, I'll come back home and do domestic stuff and be a good husband and father. So she stayed in Alaska and waited. That's, that's a beautiful relationship right there. And so, uh, well, I guess there I was trying to look for a picture of him holding the squirrel earlier, but there you go with a raccoon. And that is a pretty cute little guy. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a real raccoon, but they're crazy uh, human-like. It doesn't kind of look like it. They look more like a dog or a fox, but they, like, sit on their hind their haunches and they sit there with a little something in their hand and they sit there and like eat it. They hold food like uh, little little monkeys. Um, so he retired and then he uh, he was offered a position with Alexander's traveling company as a traveling art instructor. And he taught classes across the country um, before he ended up back in Florida. And that's where uh, Annette, his future business partner, she was, her and her husband, uh, her husband was in, I think he was a retired CIA officer. And they both went and took a, a class just by happenstance, um, I think in Tampa, around there, with Bob Clearwater, is a little north of Tampa, on the west coast of Florida. And she said, I became very aware of an effect that Bob was having on the students. Very calming, very quiet. I'd never seen anything like it, and I was mesmerized by him. Before returning to her home in Northern Virginia, the Kowalskis invited Ross out for a burger and pitched the idea of launching their own series of painting seminars. And, and remember, and Bob agreed and they formed a business partnership and that was the start of the Bob Ross Inc. Incorporated. Not to be confused with painting um, Inc. But yeah, I was going to say, remember, uh, you know, the blueprint was already laid out by Bill Alexander, and apparently he got a little resentful at Bob's success later on in life, but uh, they said that Bob in his first episode ever um, paid proper homage to Bill Alexander, and uh, yeah, Bill had already made the blueprint, and I think that's that's something to remember about the human story. The more I read biographies, learn about history, there's always a blueprint, even for um, great artists and, and you know innovators like Bob, with his innovative, calm approach. Is that uh, there's always something you need a blueprint to work from the canvas is never blank. There's always an outline and then you put your own spin on it. And you it doesn't inhibit you from using multiple outlines and superimposing them to create your own unique product. But uh it's um 
I think it's just encouraging to remember that there's always, uh, you know, no one ever actually just comes up with ideas completely, uh, a novel, revolutionary idea out of nothing. There's always stuff. And so I guess the moral of that is that you want to learn and be exposed to as much information and experience and, and people and other lives and stories and imaginations as possible to inspire you and uh, what you might create in the future. And so, after this, uh, I guess, you know, I'm going to have to, I'll make this part one, and this will be Bob's story leading up to the foundation of um, the Bob Ross Inc. and the joy of painting. So Bob was obviously already trying to be an entrepreneur, and this lady, his future business partner, Annette Kowalski, let's see. Um, had some business acumen, obviously, and she had an eye, there she is right there, for, for knowing, uh, you know, seeing the vision of what Bob could, could be if he was to start his own business and have the exposure that television or his own company might be able to give him. And they really had a grassroots situation going on there back then, in the early 80s. Um, I don't know if they say what date, what date it was. But um, they started off in shopping malls. They would put ads in the paper. Even though we ran expensive newspaper ads, they wouldn't even have that much success. Another great lesson not to be discouraged by initial lack of exposure and success and attention. And <laughs> at one point they even created 1-800-BOB-ROSS, a toll-free hotline. It was going slow, but Ross himself was patient. And I love this, this phrase. The first step in accomplishing, Bob said, first to me, the first step in accomplishing anything is to believe that you can do it. Probably one of the most important things for Bob, Bob said to me, was, Kowalski says, if you do what you love, the money will come. I think that might be the core ethos of my channel. I never want to do anything artificial. I just want to do what inspires me. What I love. <laughs> what brings me joy, I guess. And this guy is certainly one of those things. Watching this guy is just a pleasant experience. It's a good time. And uh, so we see the general trajectory of where Bob's going. And it's a beautiful thing because we obviously know his ultimate success on TV, but um, it's really cool to see him, uh, to find out that he persevered through a lot of failures and slow starts. And here we go about his hair. Um, with expenses mounting, he decided he could save money if he permed his naturally straight hair. <laughs> to avoid the need to pay for regular haircuts. A choice that would haunt him for the rest of his life because once he got that signature look, he couldn't ever, ever change his hair. And he was so mad about that, Kowalski says. He got tired of having that curly hair. It's interesting though, that's a little bit of a nugget of maybe her very, uh, what's a polite? What's a diplomatic and tactful way of saying domineering? Um, 
nature and attitude and control of the business side of things. Of course, a business manager wouldn't want you to disrupt the uh, a brand and so the final leg of the pre pre joy of painting adventure was that he uh, and, and here we go here's a a, t a testament to the business acumen of uh, Annette Kowalski here is that Bob she had the she, she had the good sense to um, spend a little money and record a commercial and have the um, awareness to realize that his mentor Alexander and it says retired mentor so I'm assuming there was some obviously not bad blood if he was willing to um, be a part of, you know, this uh, advertisement here. But Bill Alexander, they recorded a commercial of Bill Alexander literally passing off his paintbrush to his formal, former pupil. When the Kowalskis brought the clip of Bob painting to their local Virginia public television station, WNBC, the reaction they received was overwhelming. So, uh, they immediately saw it. And it was uh, just a commercial bit, I guess. And, um, but the television station immediately said, would you guys agree to do a television series? And she said, would we ever? And that series was titled The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. Beautiful stuff. Okay. And with that, we're going to call that part one. Bob Ross's adventure, the lead up to the joy of painting, the beginnings of Bob Ross. Thanks for watching, and God bless.